Dr. Miguel Perales is a Deputy Service Chief of the Adult Bone Marrow Transplant Service and Director of the Adult Bone Marrow Transplant Fellowship Program at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, where he joined the faculty in 2001. He is an Assistant Professor of Medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College. He is a member of, the, of a number of scientific associations and serves on the Alliance CALGB Transplant Committee, the ASBMT Education Committee, and the NMDP Systems Capacity Initiative Physician Working Group and Curriculum Subgroup. He also serves as co-chair for the CIBMTR Graph Sources and Manipulation Working Committee. His clinical research areas of interest include the use of allogeneic bone marrow transplantation for hematologic malignancies, as well as the development of new immune-based strategies for the treatment of cancer. Dr. Perales received his MD degree from the Free University of Brussels in Belgium. He completed a postdoctoral fellowship in HIV immunology and his residency in internal medicine at Tufts New England Medical Center in Boston. He also completed a fellowship in medical oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He will be speaking today on early complications post-transplant. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Perales. Okay, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak today. And the topic of uh, my talk is early complications after stem cell transplant. These are my disclosures. So what I'd like to do today is take you really through a nuts and bolts uh, talk about uh, complications after stem cell transplant. And as many of you know, who take care of these patients, these can be relatively sick and complicated patients. Uh, but ultimately, with a better understanding of the complications that we face, uh, we help to provide uh, better care and, and improve outcomes. So what are some of the complications that we're going to focus on? We're going to look at uh, regimen toxicity, including uh, mucositis and bleeding complications, uh, complications such as engraftment syndrome, uh, specific organ complications that are seen after transplant, and obviously spend quite some time talking about infections and management of the ICU patient. Uh, one area I won't touch on, which is a significant complication of transplant, at least allogeneic transplant, is graft versus host disease, but that's already been discussed in another venue. So first, let's get some idea about what is the mortality after transplant. This is CIBMTR data. This is 100-day mortality after autologous transplant. And then 100-day mortality is often uh, considered one of the main uh, time points in many uh, clinical studies. So as you can see, um, as you well know, the main indications for autologous transplant are multiple myeloma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and Hodgkin's disease. You can see here that the mortality at 100, at 100 days is actually very low uh, for an autologous stem cell transplant. And illustrated here in patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, patients with more advanced disease tend to have high risk of mortality. When we switch to uh, allogeneic transplant, where the main indications are patients with acute leukemia or myelodysplastic syndrome, you see that the mortality rates do increase. And again, we see this association between more advanced disease and a higher risk of mortality. The first slide was uh, identical sibling transplants. This is unrelated donor transplants. And you see that all the curves shift up slightly. And this is in part driven by graft versus host disease, since the risk of graft versus host disease is higher with an unrelated donor. And some of it may also be the fact that patients take longer to be referred for transplant when we're doing a mud transplant. So what are the causes of death between different transplant modalities? Again, this is CIBMTR registry data. So you can see that for autologous transplant, the main cause of transplant failure is relapse of disease. In contrast, uh, in patients getting allogeneic stem cell transplant, because of so-called graft versus leukemia or graft versus tumor effects, the risk of relapse is significantly lower, but patients die of other complications. Graft versus host disease is one of the main complications and an infection. So if we draw a timeline of stem cell transplant, uh, thinking about uh, some of the complications, we see that early on, Patients undergo a conditioning regimen, so they're at risk of mucositis, uh, infections due to neutropenia, hemorrhagic cystitis uh, when we use cyclophosphamide, cardiomyopathy, uh, SOS, also known as VOD, and graft rejection. Uh, 
Once the graft has taken, patients are at risk for graft versus host disease, opportunistic infections including uh, EBV lymphoma as well as relapse. And then there are also some late complications that I won't really touch on today, which include endocrine complications such as hypothyroidism, uh, growth retardation in kids, infertility, as well as cataracts, and also an increased risk of secondary malignancies. So let's start off with regimen toxicities. Um, when we think about regimen toxicity, it's directly related to the regimen intensity. And so I referenced a publication in, in BBMT from a couple of years ago where they basically categorized the different types of regimens that we're using by intensity. And so the current definitions that we're using are myeloablative, reduced intensity, and non-myeloablative. The common toxicities that we see are related to the conditioning, obviously side effects of chemotherapy and radiation, as well as organ toxicity. And this involves most of the organs, including the, the oral mucosa, the bone marrow, the lung, heart, lung, kidney, liver, and the nervous system. And we're going to touch on all of those uh, during the talk. So organ toxicity in terms of marrow toxicity, obviously these patients are for the most part neutropenic and we support them with uh, uh, growth factors. Uh, patients who are anemic receive transfusional support and the same is true for patients who are thrombocytopenic. Um, we rarely use factor support for patients who are anemic these days because of the association uh, in, sol in solid tumor cancers between the use of erythropoietin and relapse. So in most cases, we try and avoid um, erythropoietin in patients who are treating with curative intent. Uh, the mucositis we'll spend a bit more time on. Uh, obviously, the, the incidence and severity of mucositis is directly associated to the intensity of the PrEP as well as patients' prior therapy. So patients who've had prior radiation uh, to the neck are more likely to, to suffer from mucositis uh, regardless of the PrEP intensity. Um, mucositis is one of the main complaints of patients during the transplant is associated with pain and the inability to, uh, to swallow. And, and we have several tools to help uh, manage mucositis. Uh, we can try and prevent it using a drug called palifermin. And, and most of our efforts, aside from prevention, really focus on managing the symptoms pain control and uh, TPN. So this is some data from studies uh, using palifermin. Palifermin is recombinant KGF, um, and basically what it does, it protects the mucosa uh, against uh, the treatment. Um, this is the study that was published in the New England Journal. This was a randomized uh, placebo-controlled phase three study, which led to approval of the drug. And this was done in patients getting an autologous stem cell transplant, which was TBI-based. And you see that there's a significant reduction in uh, severe mucositis, duration of mucositis, uh, patient uh, score for pain, patient score for swelling, uh, well-being score, as well as functional well-being. So all of these uh, factors were significantly uh, impacted by the use of uh, palifermin, which reduced mucositis. Now, the palifermin doesn't seem to work in all the settings. Uh, this was a paper that uh, is currently in press uh, in BMT, and uh, this is in patients getting autologous stem cell transplant with a chemotherapy-based regimen, malfolan, uh, for myeloma. And you can see here between the patients in the control group, patients who got pre and post palifermin, and patients who just got it pre, there was no significant difference in the, the incidence of mucositis or severe mucositis. When we switch to patients undergoing allogeneic stem cell transplant, what I'm showing here is uh, data from two different studies. The first study is a uh, prospective randomized controlled study. Uh, the primary endpoint of that study was actually GVH, but there was a, a mucositis endpoint. And you can see that there's no significant difference between the use of uh, palifermin or the placebo in this group. Now, in this particular study, they combined patients who were getting TBI uh, as well as chemotherapy regimens and didn't separate them out in the analysis. Um, in contrast, in a, in a study that uh, our center reported uh, last year, when we looked specifically at patients undergoing an allogeneic stem cell transplant with high-dose TBI, and we compared patients who received palifermin to those uh, who hadn't, and we used surrogate markers for, uh, for mucositis, which included how many days they spent on the PCA, how many days they had TPN, and how long they were in the hospital. You can see that there was a significant reduction in all of those uh, with the use of palifermin. So I think what we conclude from this is that palifermin seems to protect patients from mucositis 
in TBI containing regimens, but that may not be the case in chemotherapy regimens. And in fact, in the paper that we did, which I'm not showing you, when we looked at patients getting an ablative a chemotherapy containing regimen, we didn't see any difference uh, between palifermin or no palifermin. Engraftment syndrome is a, is a complication that is seen primarily in autologous stem cell transplant. Uh, depending on the series, uh, the incidence uh, is between 7 to 10 percent. Um, as the name implies, it occurs around the time of engraftment, so we usually see it 7 to 12 days after transplant, and it's associated with an increased capillary leak. Uh, the clinical presentation, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is a uh, sudden or progressive onset of shortness of breath, a fever, and a rash. Um, when we uh, image these patients, because of the shortness of breath, we see uh, bilateral ground glass opacities, as well as some uh, higher consolidations. And, and the treatment, which is very effective, is a short course of steroids. And so many of you will have seen these patients uh, on the service who are um, starting to engraft and looking well and then within 24 hours uh, appear quite sick and then 24 hours later after steroid start uh, are looking great again and, and, and asking when they can be discharged. A more significant complication which uh, somewhat uh, m overlaps with uh, engraftment syndrome in terms of clinical presentation is uh, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Uh, fortunately, this is a very rare complication occurring in less than 1% but where the mortality is, is very high, it's 80% mortality. And this syndrome is associated with infection uh, in the lung causing diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Uh, the clinical presentation, again, is a sudden and progressive onset of shortness of breath uh, associated with tachypnea and hypoxia. Um, although it's, uh, it's termed alveolar hemorrhage, it's rare for the patients to actually have clinical hemoptysis. Um, but what is characteristic is um, on bronchoscopy, that uh, the more we wash the, the lungs, the more blood return we see. And so it's that increasing blood return on the BAL which is indicative of, of this diagnosis. Uh, these patients can get very sick very quickly and, and, and rapidly deteriorate and end up in the ICU. And the treatment for this is high-dose steroids as well as uh, transfusional support. And in refractory cases, uh, we have used recombinant human factor 7. I'm going to touch just briefly on cognac toxicity. Obviously, one of the main issues there is to think about the patient's uh, prior cardiac history. And as we transplant older patients, many of them come to us already with pre-existing coronary disease or cardiac arrhythmias. And many patients, too, have had complications from prior therapy, such as anthracyclines. Um, so patients can have pre-existing cardiomyopathy, or they can develop cardiomyopathy post-transplant related to specific drugs. Uh, arrhythmias, again, can be pre-existing or a result of uh, drugs that we're giving them during the transplant or electrolyte abnormalities. And then a very common uh, complication after transplant is hypertension uh, with the use of calcineurin inhibitors. Uh, renal toxicity, uh, more typically we see acute renal toxicity early after transplant. Uh, common causes are ATN. Uh, complications related to drugs, in particular calcineurin inhibitors, uh, amphotericin B, uh, use of aminoglycosides, although that's uh, probably decreasing at most centers. And then patients with uh, VOD can develop a hepatorenal syndrome. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, less common causes of, of renal complications are tumor lysis syndrome. Uh, in general, most patients who are coming to transplant have a low burden of disease. And, and if they do have disease, uh, we prophylax them with allopurinol. So it's, it would be unusual to see uh, tumor lysis, but it can happen. Uh, we do see uh, TMA or thrombotic microangiopathy with the uses of calcineurin inhibitors. And we can also, in some cases, see um, hemolysis, which is due to ABO incompatibility. But usually that's known ahead of time, and so we, we can try and prophylax those patients with uh, hydration. Um, as you well know, in many cases, renal complications uh, are multifactorial, and the typical patient is the older patient who's on a calcineurin inhibitor, whose creatinine is already rising, might be diabetic, um, and then they go septic, or they have an infection, and they end up on ambosome or some other nephrotoxic drug, such as Foscarnet. And, and managing these patients can be quite complicated, and, and often uh, calling the renal consultation service early is a good idea. So I want to spend a couple of slides talking about uh, hepatic sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, uh, or previously known as uh, venoocclusive disease. Uh, 
This is really a, a transplant specific uh, complication that uh, most commonly seen is, is, is almost exclusively seen in transplant patients, although it can be seen in some patients getting chemotherapy. Uh, the typical triad is uh, hepatomegaly with right upper quadrant pain. Uh, patients have uh, fluid retention, including ascites, and, and typically progress to develop jaundice. Um, they also have significant weight gain. Um, they become refractory to platelet transfusions and develop a coagulopathy. The incidence of, uh, of SOS is somewhat hard to, uh, to appreciate from the literature. Uh, depending on the series, it's reported between 10 to 50 percent, which is obviously a, a pretty wide range. Um, the, probably the clinically relevant incidence of VOD is probably less than 10 percent. Um, but if you use sophisticated testing on, uh, systematically on all patients, you will get higher incidences. What is the pathophysiology for, uh, for SOS? It's uh, as far as, can we, as we can understand, uh, based on current, on, uh, current uh, biology, it's caused by damage to the endocellular lining of the hepatic sinusoids. This leads to intra intrahepatic uh, thrombosis and hemostasis and central lobular hemorrhagic necrosis. So the pathologic picture is very different from what you would see in, in alcoholic cirrhosis. Um, this progresses then to portal vein obstruction and liver failure with cardiopathy, as well as a hyper, uh, hepatorenal syndrome. The risk factors for, for SOS include uh, any pre-existing liver condition. So any patient who has a prior history of hepatitis, uh, B, uh, B or C, or, or drug-induced hepatitis, uh, obviously patients with cirrhosis or patients with high levels of ferritin in the liver, uh, patients uh, receiving a second transplant or who are heavily pretreated with chemotherapy. And then depending on the conditioning regimen, um, certainly the high-dose transplant regimens are associated with a high risk of VOD. And there's also been a particular association uh, due to the combination of um, high-dose busulfan and serolimus uh, was seen in a randomized study actually uh, to be associated with, with uh, VOD. Um, it's important to have a, a, a high level of clinical suspicion for these patients and, and be prepared to, uh, to pursue a diagnosis. Uh, typically, we start off with an ultrasound, and, and what we're looking for in addition to hepatomegaly and ascites is uh, the presence of an abnormal portal vein waveform and reversal of, uh, of flow in the, in the portal vein. Um, ultimately, a liver biopsy may also lead to diagnosis. But in most cases, uh, the clinical presentation, an elevated bilirubin, and an ab abnormal ultrasound will make the diagnosis without uh, requirement for a biopsy. So what can we do to prevent or, or treat uh, SOS? Um, we don't have that many options, which is why it's important to, uh, to try and uh, stratify the patients uh, beforehand and, and carefully select them for transplant, and particularly the conditioning regimen. Um, we commonly use low-dose heparin as well as uh, osodiol, and in Europe they're now studying the use of defibrotide uh, as a preventive drug. Um, the only treatment that uh, is known to work for, uh, for SOS is defibrotide. Um, this is a drug that's been studied quite ex extensively in the U.S., although has uh, yet to uh, get uh, FDA approval, but many centers have this drug available on, on an expanded access uh, study. And, uh, Hopefully, uh, at some point in the not too distant future, we will get approval for this drug. Uh, some neurological complications that can be seen after transplant. Um, obviously, these include infections uh, involving the CNS symptom, uh, system. Uh, we can see toxicity uh, from chemotherapy, in particular fludarabines, which is associated with uh, cerebellar complications, uh, disaster balance problems, as well as uh, memory loss. Uh, some of the changes uh, we see with fludarabine are reversible, but some can be irreversible. Um, the risk of fludarabine toxicity is particularly associated with extensive fludarabine use prior to transplant, uh, prior CNS complications, um, and older patients. And then uh, calcineur inhibitors uh, have significant neurological complications as well, which I'll uh, touch on. So I want to uh, <clears throat> spend one slide talking about some of the the, the toxicity of the drugs that we use to prevent graft-versus-host disease. Um, the, the one I left off of this slide is methotrexate, which is only used intermittently uh, early after transplant, and, and the main complication of the methotrexate is uh, increasing mucositis. Uh, but the drugs that patients are on relatively long-term after transplant include uh, the, the calcineurin inhibitors, uh, serolimus, and uh, MMF. 
the psychosporin and tacrolimus are associated with uh, renal dysfunction, electrolyte abnormalities with uh, issues managing potassium and magnesium. They uh, almost universally cause hypertension in our patients, which is treatable. Um, and they also cause neurological side effects. Uh, most commonly, we'll see tremors in patients, especially if levels are slightly on the higher side. Uh, in patients with toxic levels, we can actually see seizures. Um, we can see a cortical blindness. We can see a worsening of symptoms of peripheral neuropathy. Um, the drugs can also cause other complications such as uh, liver toxicity, uh, hirsutism, as well as uh, hemolytic anemia or atypical uh, hemolytic anemia uh, syndrome. Fortunately, those are rare but very serious uh, complications. Uh, the main complications we see with serolimus, which is uh, often used in combination with tacrolimus, is uh, hyperlipidemia, as well as uh, mild, uh, uh, mild suppression. Uh, I, I also mentioned the, the complication of SOS when it's combined with high-dose busulfan, and I think most of us now recognize that that's not a combination that should be used, um, although it has been used safely with lower doses of busulfan. And then the main complications seen with MMF are mild suppression and GI symptoms. And, and the GI symptoms can be particularly vexing because they can overlap with some of the uh, symptoms that we see in graft versus host disease, and sometimes it's hard to tease out if it's the drug or if it's the GVH. This is a, a paper we published a few uh, years ago uh, reporting a patient uh, with Hodgkin's lymphoma who developed PRESS or posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, uh, in this case due to serolimus. Uh, historically, this has been seen both with uh, cyclosporin and tacrolimus, and this was one of the first case reports with serolimus. Uh, and basically, this was a 40-year-old uh, woman with Hodgkin's lymphoma, had undergone a conventional reduced-intensity transplant, was doing relatively well uh, on prophylaxis with serolimus, and uh, presented with blindness. And this is her MRI, which has a typical uh, a flare imaging, uh, we stopped the serolimus. Uh, interestingly, her blood pressure was actually not that elevated, uh, but we controlled her blood pressure. And a month later, this was her MRI, and she had fully regained her vision and uh, had been switched to a different uh, GVHD prophylaxis regimen. So switching to uh, infections, um, this is probably one of the most uh, important slides uh, that I share with uh, fellows or residents or or PAs or NPs on the service. Uh, I think if you understand this slide, you understand most of the complications that we manage uh, both early and, and late after transplant. So this is looking at um, bacterial, viral, and fungal infections, and we break this down to three different time periods, uh, pre-engraftment, post-engraftment, and the late phase. And the factors that drive these different phases, obviously, are uh, the neutropenia, uh, breakdown of the mucosal integrity, uh, as well as uh, the presence of central venous catheters. Then once patients uh, recover their counts and recover from the early toxicity of the conditioning regimen, they still have delayed immune recovery. In addition, patients with acute GVHD are going to have both defects of uh, their immune system related to GVHD, but particularly to the treatments and the added immune suppression that we give them for GVHD. And this then persists in patients with chronic GVHD who also have uh, impaired immune recovery. So bacterial infections include obviously uh, gram-negative, gram-positive organisms uh, seen early on and during uh, the period of neutropenia. Um, in patients who've recovered their counts, you can still see a higher risk of encapsulated uh, bacteria um, because these patients are, are functionally hyposplenic uh, and may need prophylaxis in the setting of uh, chronic GVHD. Uh, viral infections, uh, patients are at risk for reactivation with HSV, which is why these patients are maintained long-term on, on prophylaxis with acyclovir. Um, CMV reactivation in patients who are seropositive, which is about two-thirds of our population. Uh, late reactivations of VZV. Um, obviously, uh, respiratory viruses uh, follow a seasonal pattern, and uh, we certainly had several uh, patients this winter with flu as well as with RSV. And uh, we've also had what seems to be an outbreak of norovirus in the, in the New York area. And so we've had patients with all these viruses. Um, we'll talk a bit more in detail about uh, CMV and EBV. Uh, fungal infections, um, those are seen mostly in patients who have uh, prior periods of neutropenia. So your typical patient who's at risk for fungal pneumonia is a patient with acute leukemia or a patient with MDS. 
and those patients obviously at risk of, of developing these infections during the transplant or reactivating them, if you will. Um, and in addition, patients with chronic uh, or with acute graft versus host disease um, who are on steroids are also at risk for these infections. And in fact, clinical trials data has shown in randomized studies that these patients should be prophylaxed uh, for, these, for these infections. So understanding the, the, the types of infections you can get, I wanted to show you some data that looks at, uh, at the immune recovery and the association with infections. So this is data from my colleague uh, Trudy Small. On the left, uh, she looks at children. On the right, uh, adult patients. And this is the CD4 recovery over time. You see here in, the, in sort of the shaded areas the normal CD4 count. And you can see already that the kids recover much faster than the adult patients, and that's because they have a thymus, whereas in, in adult patients the thymus tends to involve. And then the black dots represent patients with opportunistic infections, and you see that there are many more black dots on the right side. So the older patients have a delayed immune recovery and at my, much higher risk for opportunistic infections, and therefore monitoring these patients and adequate uh, prophylaxis is critical uh, to managing them. And this is looking at uh, more recent data from our center focusing on cord blood transplants. You see again there's recovery of CD4 counts over time. And on the left panel, we looked at uh, the types of infections we see. This is uh, up to day 30, up to day 60, up to day 120. In blue is bacterial infections. So you see, they see the peak is early on, decreases over time. In red is viral infections. And you see those sort of maintain over time. But by the time patients are between six months to one year, the, the only infections we're really dealing with are, are viral infections in these patients. And again, more data to illustrate uh, the significant uh, risk of infections. This is patients uh, from a series that we reported uh, with acute GVHD that was refractory to steroids. So these patients had failed first-line steroids and then got second-line therapy with a drug called decluzumab that targets activated T cells. And what we did in these 57 patients is document every single infectious event from the time of treatment and, and for six months period. And basically, out of 57 patients, 54 of them had a documented infection, and one patient had sepsis with no documented bug. So essentially, 96% of the patients had a serious life-threatening infection. And then we broke it down into bacterial only, fungal only, viral only, and then combined bacterial, fungal, and viral infection. So you see a third of the population in this series had both bacterial infections, fungal infections, and viral uh, infections. And these were all documented infections. So these are really sort of the, the highest risk patients that we have because of the immune suppression. So we talked about this, some of the risk factors for bacterial infections include the neutropenia, and we mentioned the, the common infections. I think it's always very important to work closely with the ID service and understand what your local pattern of resistance is and, and appropriately select antibiotics based on that pattern of resistance. Um, viral infections, we talked about uh, seasonal variations, and I want to focus uh, on some of the infections that can actually be transmitted from the donor. Um, a series of, this, uh, of these infections are, are viruses that we screen for in the donor, and these include CMV, EBV, HHV6, uh, hepatitis, HAV, HTLV1, and West Nile virus. And so it's obviously very important in the unrelated or related donor setting to appropriately screen your donors and, and select the donor based on these uh, exposures. So CMV is a, is a virus that, uh, although we've made a lot of improvements in managing CMV, we still have a ways to go. Um, in, in the old days, as they say, the, the risk of reactivation uh, was 70 to 80 percent, and uh, a third of the patients who developed uh, reactivation actually developed disease. And uh, before we had good drugs to manage CMV, one of the major causes of deaths in the first three months was interstitial pneumonia, and half of those patients died of CMV. So fortunately, uh, we've made improvements since then. What are the risk factors for, for CMV reactivation? The primary risk factor is patient uh, seropositive status. So it's really the patient's CMV which is reactivating. In an allogeneic transplant, where the patient is seronegative and the donor is positive, the rate of transfer from a positive donor to a negative patient is probably in the order of 20 to 30%. Um, other risk factors include uh, T cell depletion, 
uh, as well as patients who are cord blood recipients and, and graft versus host disease. So how do we manage CMV? The, the current strategy is based on preemptive treatment, which means that we basically do weekly or biweekly testing by PCR, uh, looking for the presence of CMV viremia, and we treat them based on viremia. So we treat them before they actually develop disease. The drugs that we use commonly are Algancyclovir, Valgancyclovir, or Foscarnet. There are other drugs that are being developed, including Maribivir and uh, CMX001, which is a liposomal formulation of, um, of Sidofovir. EBV PTLD, or post transplant nephroproliferative disease, is another viral complication. Um, basically, this is an instance where the Epstein Barr virus uh, transforms B cells and causes a proliferation of B cells, uh, which presents uh, clinically like a high grade lymphoma. Um, and it's, it's really a transformation of donor derived B cells in the absence of, of an immune response to control this. Um, this is what it looks like under the microscope. It's basically a large cell lymphoma. And you can see that when we stain it for EBA, many of the large cells are positive for the, for the virus. This, this type of lymphoma is different from a typical large cell lymphoma in the sense that it doesn't respond to chemotherapy or even radiation. Uh, the, the most commonly used therapy is rituximab, which is an anti-CD20 antibody, which is actually very effective. Uh, we can also use donor leukocyte infu infusions, where we're basically giving cells from the, from the donor. And uh, increasingly, we're developing EBV-specific T cells uh, to treat these patients. Um, adenovirus is uh, something that's seen more typically in kids. Uh, the, the incidence of disease is actually quite rare, and the risk factors are similar to, to CMV. Um, it can cause a, a series of different uh, clinical syndromes, um, and the treatment, unfortunately right now, the only treatment we have is Sidofa, which is quite toxic, and so we're hopeful that uh, the CMX will provide uh, better therapy. So viral specific T cells, I'm not sure if you went to uh, some of the sessions uh, at the meeting where Kath Bollard presented, or actually this morning there was another speaker who talked about these virus specific T cells. So many groups are now developing T cell specific for uh, viral infections. Um, and this can also be used in the third party setting, meaning you have cells from a donor that are stored in the freezer, and then you have a patient who has the disease who may not have a donor, such as a cord blood recipient in this study and you can give them uh, these T cells. So this is a young man that we treated who had AML, who was a cord blood recipient, so there was no donor cells available. Uh, he developed an EBV in the gut, which is seen here on PET scan. He failed rituximab. We gave him uh, third-party T cells, and he basically cleared his virus uh, here in red and also cleared his PET scan and is actually doing well uh, a few years out. Um, Fungal infections, I think for the sake of time, we'll just uh, move, look at some of the data. Um, it's currently accepted the standard of care that patients should be prophylaxed. So this is data from Kiran Ma looking at the incidence of candidemia. You can see in white is the, the risk of candidemia pre-prophylaxis and in black is post-prophylaxis. So significant reduction in the incidence of candidemia from 11 to just under 5%. But uh, since they were using fluconazole, a high incidence of, uh, of non-candidate albicans, which is resistant to fluconazole. And what we've seen over time is an increase in aspergillus, uh, particularly in the allotransplant setting. So these are the NCCN guidelines, which are available on the website, uh, which uh, give recommendations in terms of prophylaxis um, for um, patients undergoing stem cell transplant. Um, PCP or PJP, uh, prophylaxis is standard, and we commonly use either aerosolized pentamidine, Bactrim, or Dapsone, and usually until the CD4 count reaches uh, 200. And then Toxo is also a, a rare but a significant complication that can be fatal, and again, we monitor these patients with PCR, and we give them standard prophylaxis with Bactrim or Tovaquam. We'll skip that. Um, there's much more detail uh, that have been published in the guidelines in the ASBMT on infections, both prevention and management. And just a, a couple of slides on ICU management. Obviously, this is a multidisciplinary effort to treat these basic uh, patients. 
Uh, I just wanted to share some of the data with you. This is outcomes for autologous stem cell transplant, uh, 1,000 patients transplanted, 34 ICU admissions, so an incidence of only 3%. 13 of the 34 patients died, so the overall mortality was 1%. So again, mortality in autologous transplant are extremely low, but still mortality in patients who go to the ICU. This is uh, data for allogeneic stem cell transplants from a French series, and you see that patients who end up getting mechanical ventilation um, have a significantly lower mortality, uh, survival than patients who go to the ICU but don't require mechanical ventilation. Uh, we do have prognostic tools to try and risk stratify these patients, and this is uh, data from a Soros paper in blood, which basically shows that the risk of complications, non-relapse mortality, and the likelihood of survival immediately correlate with these comorbidity index uh, scores. And I think this is actually very helpful when we think of the transplant patient, uh, whether we should transplant them at all, and what conditioning regimen we should be using to calculate these scores. And there are actually apps available, on, on, uh, at least on the, on, the app, on the iPhone app store, that you can actually plug the data into your phone and, and get the score and the risk of mortality. But I wanted to finish on a positive note, which is the, the one-year survival after ablative conditioning for patients uh, in acute leukemia remission. And you can see this is over time, so going back to the early 90s until a few years ago, and you see that we are doing better both in uh, matched sibling transplants and unrelated donor sibling transplants. And in fact, these curves are starting to come together. And, and obviously, there are many reasons behind that, uh, including better HLA typing, donor selection, patient selection, and supportive care. But I think we are, we are making significant improvements in this direction. And so I will uh, close with that and be happy to take questions.